March. And for more on the humanitarian emergency unfolding right now in Sudan, I'm joined live now by Kate Main of Vorley, CARES Regional Director for East and Central Africa. Kate, thank you so much for being with us. It's really hard you know, to put into words just what people are dealing with right now on the ground in Sudan, just how dire the situation is. I mean, it's one thing for dual nationals, dual citizens who have the option, I'm not saying it's easy, but have the, who have the option of getting out. But it's another thing entirely for the people who are trapped inside places like Khartoum. Yes, very, very true, very true, Zain. And, you know, what we're hearing from our staff is, is exactly the realities on the ground. We have, you know, Sudanese people are trapped in their own homes. They're not able to go out, um, paralyzed by fear because of the ongoing fighting. We know there has been some, you know, there, you know, there's been a cessation. There's been some lull in the fighting, but it hasn't really stopped altogether. And even when they're, they are able uh, or risk to go out, the prices of food and fuel has exponentially gone very high. Um, and of course, we are seeing the, the, the displaced people um, moving out of Sudan, going into Chad and South Sudan. And that's exacerbating uh, a humanitarian uh, situation that was already there before. You know, we have to remember that Sudan, you know, this was one of the countries that had 15, over 15 million Sudanese who were in need of assistance due to, you know, droughts, floods and disease outbreaks. That's one in every three people. Um, and then you have to think about the four million under five who are malnourished and pregnant and lactated women, lactating women. So it's 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 adding to a very dire situation in in a region that was already facing so many challenges and a humanitarian response that wasn't fully that isn't fully funded. When I think of um, you know the fact that seventy percent of the hospitals in places like Khartoum are no longer functioning, I mean my mind immediately goes to you know, people who are um, maybe on dialysis, you know, people who are cancer patients in need of chemotherapy, people who might be in desperate need of a blood transfusion. I mean, what happens to people? I mean, obviously, people go to the hospital um, and seek emergency care for all sorts of reasons, but some of those reasons are extremely serious and the alternative options are very limited. Yeah, very true. And, and this situation just goes to further compromise and already compromise situation. You know, from every angle, as you said, people are dealing with conditions um, where they need to access uh, health centers. So if 70% of them are down, what does that mean for patients who need to access services? Um, and these are people often, you know, given the, the socioeconomic dynamics in Sudan that have very few coping mechanisms in the first place. So when we have a compounded conflict on an already dire situation, uh, we are actually eroding any coping mechanisms that, that people would have. And we know, given our experience working in the humanitarian space, that it is women, girls and children who are disproportionately affected by this. And, and we should expect more deaths, um, be it for lack of food, lack of water, increase in uh, disease, not being able to access the health care. And just in terms of, I mean, people are obviously fleeing the country there. Many are heading to South Sudan, some are heading to Chad, um, other countries in the region as well. I mean, these are countries that aren't exactly wealthy and their resources are already strained. I mean, Chad, we were actually just showing, I think, a refugee camp in Chad. Chad has been accepting people fleeing because of conflict, because of climate change, for all sorts of economic re reasons. What sort of strain that this added influx of refugees from Sudan put on their facilities right now? Yeah, so so you're quite right. Chad has been home to displaced uh, Sudanese even before this armed conflict. Uh, and so we are seeing more and more people moving into Chad. It's already home to over 1 million possibly displaced persons, Yeah, including about 600,000 refugees, mainly from Sudan, from the Central African Republic, Cameroon and Nigeria and 381,000 uh, displaced persons from Chad itself. So this is compounding already a humanitarian response a crisis in Chad. And so, you know, there are critical needs there for water, for sanitation, for shelter and protection. Uh, we, we've been part of the, the team that did the first assessment. So CARE was there doing the first assessment led by UNHCR. And we are seeing that most of the refugees are, are women and children uh, and they are largely putting up temporary shelters uh, and settlements in, in three villages along the borderline. 
and those you know there are critical needs there that we need to be responding to so as care we we are starting to put up latrines we're delivering uh, gbv gender based violence sessions and we're also providing some cash assistance in chad um, and as you said we are seeing uh, refugees also fleeing to to south sudan as well so this this armed conflict if it is if there isn't a complete cessation is really mm -hmm. going to further destabilize the region yeah, and I mean, our correspondent, I'm not sure if you even heard what he was saying, but he was just talking about this idea that, you know, it's all well and good to extend a ceasefire, but if the ceasefire isn't actually a ceasefire because people are still fighting, then it becomes a ceasefire in, in just name only. Um, Kate, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for all the work that CARE is doing uh, on the ground and in the region. We appreciate it. Thank you.